kiddos and welcome back. Today we're going to continue talking about reaction kinetics or the rates of chemical reactions. Last time we talked about the collision theory and today we're going to talk about factors that affect the rate of a chemical reaction. And there are a few and this video will be followed by a demonstration of all of them that I think you will enjoy. So first of all, the nature of reactants. Some substances react more readily than others. For, other, for example, copper and zinc are both metals, and they have similar physical properties because of their relative positions on the periodic table. But they react at different rates when placed in silver nitrate solutions, for example, of equal concentrations. Um, another example would be ions in solution, and that's what I have demonstrated for you here in a bit. Ions in solution, because... Um, one's positive and one's negative, there's this uh, attraction uh, for each other, and so those tend to react almost instantaneously, whereas molecular compounds tend to react much more slowly. They have to overcome some electron-to-electron -electron repulsion between molecules. So the nature of reactants is the first factor um, that we'll discuss affecting the rate of a chemical reaction. The second factor, concentration. Uh, one way we can change the rate of a reaction is by changing the concentration of the reactants. Remember, the collision theory states that particles must collide in order to react. Well, the more particles we have per unit volume, the more often collisions will occur, and the likelihood of a meaningful collision increases. So think about this. If I burn a candle in a room full of air, now the air you breathe is about 21% oxygen. And you know about how fast a candle will burn in a room full of air. But what if we put that room, in, or that candle, in a room of pure oxygen? Yeah, well, of course, the, the rate will increase because more oxygen molecules can collide with those wax molecules. And so the likelihood of a meaningful collision increases. So concentration is very important. In fact, we spend the next several videos talking specifically about how concentration affects the rate, and we develop something called rate laws, which I think you'll like. Next up is surface area. Uh, suppose you put a wooden log on a bonfire, um, and you watched it burn. Now suppose you took that same log and ground it up into sawdust, and then we sprinkled that sawdust on the fire, which would burn faster. Yeah, well, of course, the sawdust would, because we have more area available for those collisions to occur. If we just have uh, a log uh, set in my bonfire, just the surface of that log can react with the oxygen molecules and create a chemical reaction. Whereas if we grind it up, uh, more of the log can be exposed to oxygen and therefore the uh, rate would increase. So surface area, uh, increasing that is another factor that will affect the rate of a reaction. Temperature. There's an important one. Increasing the temperature will always increase the rate of a chemical reaction. Um, think about food spoiling. Why, why do you put leftovers in the refrigerator? Why don't you just leave them out on your kitchen countertop? Yeah, the reactions that cause food spoilage, the, the rate of bacterial growth, and the production of the chemicals that spoil food increases dramatically when temperature increases. Remember, meaningful collisions, not only do the molecules need to collide, but they have to collide with enough kinetic energy. And by increasing the temperature, that increases the kinetic energy of those molecules so there are more meaningful collisions. And so your food will spoil faster. So what do we do with it? Well, we put it in the refrigerator. And that slows down the rate of a reaction. So here's just a couple of graphs here. Here's um, the relative reaction rate versus temperature in Kelvin, and you can see that as temperature increases, the rate of the reaction increases right along with it. Also, remember the minimal amount of energy needed for a reaction to occur is that activation energy. So uh, T2 is a higher temperature than T1. So here's T1. Here is the average kinetic energy. Let's change colors so we can see this. The average kinetic energy of those particles is constant, but you can see the individual kinetic energies vary greatly. And so most of them are on this side of the activation energy, so they can't react. But a few of them are on that side, so a few of them can react to form products. 
Now, what if we increase the temperature? So let's take a look at those curves again. We'll get rid of this one here, and then we'll change colors again. So if we increase, so now we're going to go to T2. So look at those molecules. Their average kinetic energy increases, and here's the activation energy, and the molecules on this side don't have enough um, kinetic energy to react, but over here, don't I have a greater quantity that have enough energy to react and form products? Yeah. So increasing the kinetic energy uh, or temperature will always increase the rate. We'll get more effective collisions. Okay, the presence of a catalyst. Um, catalysts do something called they lower the activation energy, or they provide an alternative pathway for a reaction to occur. So many chemical reactions in living organisms would not occur quickly enough to sustain life at normal body temperatures. However, we have catalysts, living organisms have catalysts, and they're called enzymes. And an enzyme is a type of catalyst that increases the rate of a chemical reaction. So uh, the red curve here is the pathway that a reaction would take without a catalyst. Here is the reactant's energy, and they have to gain energy to form the activated complex here, and then, of course, they can release energy. This happens to be an exothermic process to form the products. But look at that kinetic energy that's needed, uh, or excuse me, activation energy. That's quite a large amount, and so that reaction rate would be fairly slow. Now, what if we lowered the activation energy? So we provided an alternative pathway, so now we don't need as much activation energy to form that activated complex before we form the products. Notice the products end up with the same energy, the reactants end up with the same energy, but the activation energy is much lower. So more of the particles have the ability to turn into products, and if more of them have the ability, then the reaction rate will, of course, increase. So the presence of a catalyst lowers the activation energy to speed up a chemical reaction. Remember that. And then finally, the last one we'll talk about is pressure. This only applies for gases. And my guess is you probably all already figured out that this would be the same as changing the concentration in concept B for aqueous solutions. If you increase the pressure, you squish molecules closer together, in effect, increasing their concentration. If you ex increase the volume, you expand that container, you decrease the pressure, so the molecules are farther away from each other in effect, decreasing their concentration. So uh, changing the pressure will affect the rate of a reaction only for gases, kiddos, and it's the same as changing the concentration um, of solutions and increasing or decreasing the rate, depending upon whether you increase the concentration or decrease it. Okay? All right, here's a video that I hope will explain uh, this concept a bit better. So... Enjoy the demonstrations, folks. See you soon in class. Bye-bye. Hey, kiddos. We're going to do a few demonstrations today, as you can see. We're going to talk about factors that affect the rate of a chemical reaction. And we're going to do these in the same order that we have them in your notes. Um, the first factor will be the nature of reactants. I have a couple of ionic compounds here, sodium chromate and uh, lead 2 nitrate and they have been dissolved in water. So we have ions in solution. Now, um, ions in solution react at a very, very fast rate. We'll have the positive lead ions being attracted to the negative chromate ions, and that's an instantaneous reaction. So the type of reactants you're dealing with often determine the rate of the reaction. So let me add the lead 2 nitrate to the sodium chromate, and we'll see how quickly that reaction proceeds. And you can see that the yellow precipitate forms instantaneously. Okay, so nature of reactants is a factor that affects uh, the rate of a reaction. So you can see the, the yellow precipitate there, and that will eventually uh, settle out. Now another factor I'd like to talk about would be the uh, concentration of the reactant. So I have in these two beakers some zinc ingots. You can see those at the bottom. I believe I have four zinc ingots in each. And in this graduated cylinder here, I have some six molar hydrochloric acid that's quite concentrated. When I add the six molar hydrochloric acid to the zinc ingots, 
you'll see that the, the zinc begins to react and bubble and fizz and um, at a fairly fast rate. Uh, we are producing zinc chloride in solution and hydrogen gas. So you can take a look at that rate, just qualitatively observe how quickly the hydrochloric acid is reacting with those zinc ingots. Now, the next one, I'd like to perform a dilution. I have some six molar hydrochloric acid here, 10 milliliters, and some distilled water in this graduated cylinder. I'm going to add the six molar to my um, distilled water. Go ahead and stir that so it goes into solution. And then we are going to obtain uh, 10 milliliters of that uh, diluted acid this time. So we'll pour it into this 10 milliliter graduated cylinder and get about 10 mils. So, so the same volume that I used just a moment ago. And we'll add that to the zinc ingots and we'll see how fast this reacts. So once again, here's the six molar reacting with the zinc ingots, and here is the tenfold dilution. So this is 0.6 molar. And I imagine there's some reaction going on, but it's very, very slow. So the higher the concentration, the greater chance there will be for meaningful collisions between particles and therefore the rate will increase. Okay, next up will be something called surface area. So on these two weighing boats, I have 3.17 grams of zinc ingots and 3.17 grams of zinc powder. Now to the beaker on the left, we'll be adding 10 milliliters of six molar hydrochloric acid and also to the beaker to the right. So the hydrochloric acid concentration is the same and the volume is the same. Let's go ahead and see what happens when I add the ingots to the six molar. And as we saw just a moment ago, the rate is about the same. Now let's take a look at my zinc powder with the same concentration of hydrochloric acid. We'll see how quickly this reacts. So I'll add the powder. And you can see that as the surface area increases, there's a greater chance for collision between reacting particles, and so the rate is substantially faster. So that would be uh, an increase in surface area, increasing the rate of a reaction. Uh, next up will be temperature. So I have some water on my hot plate here. Temperature of this water, it looks like it's about close to 74, 75 degrees Celsius. And then I have some ice water and that looks like that might be five or six degrees Celsius. Uh, let's go ahead and we'll add some ice water to this beaker. Hopefully just water and not too much ice. Oh, we got a couple pieces in there. And let's add an Alka-Seltzer tablet to the ice water and we'll see how quickly that reacts. So once again, we're doing this qualitatively. We're getting an idea as to how quickly that reacts with the cold water that's, what was that, about five to eight degrees Celsius. Okay. What do you think is going to happen when I add an Alka-Seltzer tablet to my warm water? Let's take a look. Same size tablet in my warm water. And you can see that the tablet reacts considerably faster. So once again, the higher the temperature, the greater the kinetic energy of reacting particles, so the greater the chance for a meaningful collision. So temperature will all, an increase in temperature will always speed up the rate of a reaction. So that Alka-Seltzer tablet has reacted, and this one here in the cold water is still slowly reacting, as you can see. Okay? All right, next up will be the addition of a catalyst. Now you will learn that a catalyst reduces something called the activation energy of a reaction. So I have for you 30% hydrogen peroxide. It's very, very concentrated hydrogen peroxide. 10 milliliters, I'll just pour into a beaker. And the hydrogen peroxide molecules actually react with each other to decompose, and they form water and oxygen gas. Now you can see that 
not much oxygen gas is being, uh, being formed right there. It's a very, very slow rate because the activation energy is very, very high for this reaction. So if I could lower the activation energy, I can speed up the rate of that reaction. So let's go ahead and we'll add 10 milliliters of hydrogen peroxide to the second beaker again. And here I have some potassium iodide dissolved in water. So I have a homogeneous catalyst. The iodide ion catalyzes this reaction. It provides what's called an alternative pathway for this reaction to proceed, and it lowers the activation energy. So let's add the iodide ion to the, uh, to the hydrogen peroxide solution. And you can see that it reacts very, very quickly to decompose. We get the brown color there, um, and that brown color is the result of I2 being formed. Um, but essentially it's the iodide ions that react. And there we go, the hydrogen peroxide is now completely decomposed to water and oxygen gas, while this one is still slowly reacting. It might take 10 or 15 years for that to eventually decompose without the catalyst. Okay, so we've talked about several things. We've talked about the nature of reactants. Talked about concentration. Remember, six molar hydrochloric acid and six tenth molar hydrochloric acid. You can see the relative rates there. We talked about surface area, and so we had zinc powder and the zinc ingots, and then temperature. Looks like this Alka Seltzer tablet might finally be dissolved. This one has long been dissolved. We then talked about the use of a catalyst and lowering the activation energy of a reaction. So I hope you enjoyed those demonstrations. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.